Uh, great. Thank you to all the panelists. So we, we had a, a breadth of uh, different experiences here. We had a traditional education publisher talking about the way that they've adapted their content for different markets. We had um, O'Reilly talking about the way that they have broadened their um, product mix, if you will, to, to seek out many different types of uh, activities and uh, opportunities around, really with a focus on the content, but, but many different ways of leveraging that content. And then we heard from uh, the Slicebooks example where technology applied to a real issue and problem uh, in distributing your content in different ways. So um, I have some questions. I'd be uh, much more interested, frankly, to hear from anybody in the audience if you want. If we want to open it up for questions now, who wants to take the first leap in asking the question? Um, yes, right in front. So I'm going to repeat the question because we don't have a microphone, unfortunately. So go ahead, David. Uh, David Smith from Cabin. Um, uh, Alan, um, you said disintermediate yourself from within, which is a great thing to say and a very hard thing to do. So I'm wondering how O'Reilly was structured or is structured to better enable that to happen. So the question is, how did uh, O'Reilly disintermediate, disintermediate from within, and what was their um, structure internally, the staffing structure, and the, the ability that made them able to do that? Um, chaotic. No. <laughs> it, it, you got to. It's just something you got to be really intentional about. And I think that you know part of the disruption came from you know people like Tim and people like Brian. That you know, what the hell business does it? publisher have doing getting into the conference business you know none you know and and but we did it anyway and you know a lot of the things that we've done and you know we, we read the tea leaves you know we and and part of it too I think is because we tend to be so close to our audience you know we see what they're doing and uh, we're small enough that uh, we can you know do some things that are are reactive to that but it's got to be super intentional because I've talked to lots of people at big companies and their jobs are to toe the line. You know, the number of co the publishing companies that now sell off of O'Reilly.com, DRM free books, but those negotiations went on for years and years and years because at the top level, you know, they were all, you know, no way we were going to, you know, succumb to DRM free. So those kinds of things. I think it, it, ta it takes leadership from, from the top. Um, just follow or, or just be just rebels, you know, that's another good way to do it. So to follow on for that question, Catherine, um, how would you see your job description for the typical editor internally changing to kind of adapt to uh, that kind of scenario or environment? Well, Cambridge is probably amongst one of the slowest machines, to, uh, boats, ships to turn. It's, um, we're not for profit. We don't take a lot of risks. We do everything very carefully, and it's kind of we've been in business for hundreds of years as a result of that. So I am probably not the best person to ask in terms of how maybe a smaller, more flexible uh, publisher or company should uh, to do their business. But I think in th there's a couple of models. The um, if somebody's got a good idea, uh, it's really hard for them to do that alongside their day job. We all have to keep our traditional revenue streams coming in. Um, so I think investment needs to be on looking at the people within your organization or hiring people that have got that spark. You know, the O'Reilly guys had that spark and, and they took it and they took risks. But you really do have to protect your main core business against that. So I would say hot house, good ideas, experiment, see what's out there, work with all the other people who are more flexible and, and smaller and, uh, and, and just take a few chances in that right. kind of protected way. Great, thank you. Um, yes, in the white. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, your failure, oh, sorry, Alan, you mentioned your failures, and one of them was um, selling sort of the, the custom content, collecting for educators and trainers. Why do you think that failed? So the question is, uh, he promised to explain why the aggregated model didn't work, uh, and that was the question. Yeah, w w one thing was we were really early. Um, but the, the biggest thing, th there were a couple things. One of them was we couldn't get enough other publishers to come along. So what, what Brian has done with Sourcebooks is really important. You know, it's, it's, it's like when, 
you know, years ago I tried to get other publishers to sell their books off of O'Reilly.com. It just seemed like a sensible thing to do, you know. But it was anathema, you know. It was, they, it just, it gave them hives to even think about talking to me about such a thing. So it, at the time it was, again, that the challenge was really getting enough content because, you know, like with O'Reilly, you know, the, the thing that made Safari succeed was if it was only O'Reilly books, it would have remained a, 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 just a small boutique. But as soon as Pearson came on with all their content too, because uh, all you have to do is look at any um, you know, technical person's bookshelf, and it's not just O'Reilly books. L wish it were, but it, what it isn't. So it takes you know, a mix of content like that. As, as Brian was saying with, you, know, you go to Australia, you know, maybe you want the Lonely Planet you know, part because you you know, still have an adventurous spirit, but at night you want the Fromers because you know, you're, you've got some more money now in your life and you don't want to, you don't want to rough it in a youth hostel, you know. <laughs> so, you know, that mix is, is a really important ingredient. Um, Brian, how do you drive uh, traffic and attention and what's your business model? Uh, publishers. It, it's really what the presentation was about, which is how much pain do we want to remain in? Uh, the internet continues to whack us, and I'm convinced there's some 20-some-odd-year-old kid 40 miles south here in Silicon Valley who unknowingly is going to create something that's going to uh, incur more pain in our industry. How do we get ahead of that? And again, uh, Ron and Joe created something that solved their pain as publishers that then as they've talked to other people. So it's, it's, it's a tool um, that, that you all can use to try to get ahead of where behavior, or not get ahead, where behavior is right now. And so it's really the business model of the software company is to sign up publishers, to have them, have them use it. Uh, there was uh, questions over here, I think. Somebody had that? Bill, go ahead. Uh, when Slicebook slices the content, does the publisher own the sliced content, or is that controlled in your Oh, it's absolutely owned by you. Well, uh, when Slicebook slices the content, who uh, does yeah. the yeah. publisher own the content? Yeah, absolutely. This is a tool. This is your tool. It's it's no intellectual property transfers. Um, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Brian, I just kind of, want, kind of want to take issue with your presentation on the history of publishing. I, had I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I I thought I covered myself. <laughs> uh, I, I really don't think the medieval period is that different from the present. Mm -hmm. um, the term, it's in the sense of every author being a publisher. Um, and it's, it's really a question of distribution and how do you get other people interested in your content? Uh, and that's really has a change. I mean, have you seen a medieval book? I mean, they're often repackaged. Somebody copies this bit, somebody copies that bit, bit and they bind it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just like what you're talking about with slice books. So there's a challenge to uh, the Gutenberg model here. So. I defer. <laughs> <laughs> No, the, the point Maybe a, uh, an argument we held offline, no, it, perhaps. It, it, <laughs> yeah, the, the point is that it's about control. And we move from a period of, in, of where there was lots of control to now we have a period where each consum consumer has the control. And, and that's what I believe really has happened. And how do we fit our strength to where the consumer is today? And that's what I was trying to explain, is how we couple that together. Okay. Yes. So the question is, to heavily paraphrase, 
um, how do we how do we re-educate uh, employees and stakeholders internally to to think differently about um, risk um, failure uh, reward those types of things and how how have the panelists addressed some of those issues internally? Well, that that's a good question. But uh, one thing is that continuing to do what you're doing is failure. You will fail. Um, and then it's, it's also, I think, having a, working in an organization that accepts failure and demands a certain amount of failure. I knew somebody who worked at Apple Computer early on, and he was criticized by Steve Jobs for not failing enough, <laughs> which means he wasn't trying enough. He wasn't risking enough. And that's a very, very different, but I think important mindset for uh, all organizations as we go forward. You know, failure is a sign of um, success in a way. Um, if you keep failing at the same thing or making the same mistakes, then there's a problem. But but that's not what we're talking about. Can I jump in? Yeah. What what we experienced at O'Reilly, we did a lot of intrapreneurialship. We started a lot of businesses inside the company, and there was the center that we always protected, which was the core technical book publishing wing, because that was our core revenue generator, and we didn't want to harm that. There were tensions as, as entrepreneurs like Alan and I started these new ventures, especially early on because it had never happened before, but it really came down to that we greatly respected the skill set of those who were the core of the business, but we had a different skill set that were, was more risk-taking. And it really came down to this moment where we said, are we going to do this? And we went, yes. And from that moment forward, everything else unfolded. There were pressures after that of how do you hold this together? How do you fold it together? Early on, we were not very good about divesting ourselves of things we had started when we had grown them as much as we could and maybe somebody else could have acquired and run off with them or taken them further. Um, so we always have this dynamic struggle of protecting the core business doing these entrepreneurial efforts and, and how did we go, cr uh, grow the core safely? And it's, it's, uh, it's yeah, a it's, 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 it's not It's not pretty <laughs> a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, we, everybody loves our ebook platform now and it's really held up as being, you know, the, one of the leaders. But when, it, a, a year after it started, you know, we st I, I still had editors who were coming to me trying to shut it down. You know, and, and you, it wasn't a success yet, you know, and we were hearing bloody murder and threats from the retailers, but, you know, I'm glad we did it. Mm -hmm. uh, Catherine, you probably get approached by different types of um, technology companies and folks with different models and so on and so forth. It must be a kind of a constant refrain at the, at the house, you know, how do you field those inquiries? How do you make a decision? You mentioned that you'd rather be in it than not, even though the revenue is probably fairly small. But, but tell us kind of how that process works internally. I think you need to engage with everyone out there and then make the decisions once you have engaged. I don't think you can turn anyone away because they may be the next O'Reilly or whatever. Um, I think quite a few of the startups we get approached by, they tend to be a salesperson and a tech person, and there's not a lot in the middle, um, quality control and the like. And um, we have to hold on to our quality, and we tend to, I guess the, the things we've had most success with, it tends to be companies that have been started by people who have already been in publishing, rather than been sales and techie. Uh, they know the business, they understand some of the things. They, tend not to be so, they're more realistic. So I guess that's kind of how we filter. And we've failed, we've tried some, and mm -hmm. we've gone down at the same time as they have. Yeah. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, on that question, so what matters to you, what kind of material you're judging? Is it mm -hmm. um, a great toilet deal, or is it a great product? Or is it marketing hours at scale? What, what, what are the criteria? So the um, question is, what's, what's the criteria when, when you evaluate those types of um, uh, opportunities that come come your way is it based on revenue uh, market share the technology itself th those types of elements I guess the it's it's their ability to deliver to the end user they may have a good idea but is it us that will have to reach the end user or will they so that's one thing that we we look at carefully the area I've been looking at most is interactivity in ebooks who's taking that to the next level who's moving on from the pl flat uh, PDF um, 
and for that is really having a strong sense of engaging again with people who've come from the traditional bit or at least some of that company has some of the traditional understanding whether it be of education or publishing um, yeah so I, th I guess that's kind of all you can do really is it's, yeah. it's just that gut instinct yeah. as to what some of the business development work that I've done where I've been in a position of approaching publishers on behalf of somebody else mm -hmm. um, you get far more mileage out of um, proposing something that's relevant to them uh, that sounds obvious, um, but you would be surprised that people who uh, knock on the publisher's door with a great idea that has absolutely nothing to do with their business, it can't move them anywhere, left, right, forward, backwards. And um, so when you do get approached by some of these companies, I think the first check really is, you know, do they know what they're talking about? Do they know whether or not this is going to impact my business or not? And if the answer is no, then obviously carefully don't, just don't return a phone call. Be very nice and tell them to go knock on somebody else's door. Um, yes? Question. So for scholarly, if you're a scholarly publisher producing scholarly content, who is best placed to make the decision about what the unit of sale is or, or the, the distributed unit? What, what is the slice? I think that actually is a very easy question, I think. Your customers. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that matters. You know, maybe chapter, you know, there, there's those kind of basic units. And if it's cheap enough, it doesn't matter. But your customers are all that matters. Yeah, I, I feel for you. We redid our contracts so that we could do what we want with the content yeah. and compensate fairly. But we have a clause in our contracts that allows us to move forward. Contracts are holding so many people back. Mm -hmm. So that the follow-up was we, we have agreements with our authors, and the authors re feel very, very strongly about the, the unit, the manuscript that they have now presented to the publisher. And how do we manage that? How do we uh, get them bought into the idea that uh, an end user might want to graph off page 253, and that's all they're interested in? Um, and, and that's a dance. That's, that's something that I think has to be um, managed together with the authors. The authors have to be participating in the process of uh, what that end user is really looking for. And it obviously doesn't happen overnight, but as Alan says, what doesn't help is, is the way that those or, or there's SOBs like me who just took somebody's graph, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and used it here. So Which I didn't ask. Can I just you say? I gave attribution, but I, I didn't ask. Yeah, Ka Catherine? Uh, we, we have to be really careful not to be author driven, and it's really important. We, we tend to, editors, um, editors amongst the Cambridge vast number, it varies hugely, but a lot are very swayed by what our authors are saying and their ideas. And you get a techie author and they've got really good ideas for what they want to do. But we have to go to our customers. So it's a lot of market research, a lot of being out there and looking at how people are using content. And it's very different to how we have been. It's not author driven in the same way. And we have to have that conversation early about breaking what they've created as a whole apart and seeing where and, and engaging them in that conversation. Because if we get them to accept that, they can help scholarly publishers decide what to do next with that content. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take a question from this side of the room. Yes? I have a question for slides, though. Um, one of the slides you had out was um, reminiscence of iTunes. Great redemption. Mm -hmm. And you said that the reminiscence of iTunes is breaking down the, the, the book at the end of the chapter level for you to purchase. Um, it's hard to discover ability, though. What's inside those chapters? On iTunes, you can listen for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. But what do you know exactly inside that chapter to offer services? So there's, there's, yeah, so there's two parts to the question, I think, as I see it. Number one is, is there an iTunes model here that we're all kind of um, thinking about in a way that this content is being broken up? And then secondly, how do we sample, how do we discover that content if it's broken into parts? What, what's going to drive that usage? First of all, it's a great idea. Um, the, what you're able to do now is to load the meta metadata in so it's, it's findable. But what... Slicebooks listens to publishers, and what you just asked is an excellent idea. 
the, the issue is if it's a slice of one page uh, isn't that the preview but um, this is the type of feedback we want from people and that that's a really good question I'll bring it back to the developers just to, on a point when we did Safari U we had a, a gating system that you know it was for educators and trainers so we kind of kind of validated that they were educators and trainers but they had full access to all the content so there was not just a snippet, it was the full thing. And that, that was one of the issues with publishers. You know, they didn't want, um, you know, when we tried to get other publishers' content, they didn't, they didn't feel comfortable with that. Yeah, and some of the things that will help discoverability are, are keywords. Um, it, yeah. Yes, journals have generally been in better shape in this respect. Yeah, so abstracts, bibliographic information, um, uh, thematic uh, concepts, uh, those types of things That's, will drive that and um, keywords. The, the, the textbook model where you tend to always have a summary at the end, that we, we're thinking of doing that across more of our books so that mm -hmm. chapters have a summary yeah. and that's what you would show. So it's yeah. the opposite of an, an abstract at the end. Yeah. Peter. So I'm sorry, question, I, did, I question, didn't hear all that, but maybe so, you did. Yeah, the question is, how did you uh, approach revising the contracts? If you were, maybe you didn't have to revise them, maybe from scratch they were thought of completely differently. But the notion that you've got a legacy uh, set of contracts with authors, how do you make, how do you manage the change so that these types of this type of flexible content is enabled through this contract? Yeah. It, with respect to royalties? Yeah, we, we did, um, when we started Safari, we, so this was a 2000, we went back and redid contracts with all uh, authors and then everybody going forward. So it's our, what I call our, our, our God saving clause nine. And it's just written in a way that, that allows us uh, to, um, you know, in fairness and openness, you know, do, experiment uh, in effect and you know they get their royalty for anything we do we're very very careful about that when things are sliced and diced it's prorated so um, you know we have formulas for doing that but it's but it works Catherine are you any perspective on contracts whether those changed on the way at Cambridge um, we haven't changed them and we probably should okay all right, I'm going to have one more question because I actually didn't realize we ran out of time. So way at the back there. So, so how do you? Changing the way they're actually building these kinds of Right. So the question has to do with scholarly apparatus. Actually, personally, I haven't heard that term before, but um, the bibliography, the end notes, those types of things, and the way that they are laid out in the book, does that currently help or hinder um, the slicing and dicing of that content? I have a little bit of perspective on that in the work that I did with some academic publishers where the books where the uh, bibliographic uh, bibliography or the notes was actually at the end of the chapters were significantly easier to manage than where it was all bum, uh, uh, dumped together, uh, dumped, not pejoratively, um, <laughs> at the back of the book because what you had to do is in order to kind of draw the association between the chapter and the notes, you actually had to bring in all of the notes from all of the chapters to each individual chapter and that's, that's not very flexible. So has that um, been something that the panel has, has had to deal with those types of, of issues, the way that the book is structured, hinders kind of some of the slicing and dicing? I, I, I can speak to it. You know, it really sucks when a chapter begins, um, as we just discussed in the last chapter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Any other perspective? Um, please come up here. We probably have this room uh, for a few more minutes. So if you've got it, 
sorry. If you've got additional questions, I'm sure the panel will be happy to hang around, and as will I. So thank you, thank you so much for being engaged. I appreciate it.